Day. Welcome to the 18th uh, meeting this of 2018 of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Uh, can I remind all members to turn off or to at least to silent any electronic devices so that they do not uh, interfere with the committee. Uh, now we are somewhat depleted this morning. We have apologies from Jackie Bailey, Kezia Dugdale, Fulton McGregor and Andy Whiteman. And on top of that, the convener, as you can see, is not here, Gordon Lindhurst. He is expecting to join us later, uh, but I will be chairing uh, in the meantime. So item one is a decision to take business in private. Uh, is the committee agreed to take items four, five and six in private? Are we agreed? Yeah. Thank you. And item two is our continuation of our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance. Uh, we've heard from a number of witnesses and today we have the Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown, uh, together with Mary McCallan, Director for Economic Development, Gary Gillespie, Chief Economist, Sam Anson, Deputy Director, Economic Policy, and Hugh McAloon, Head of Fair Work and Skills. So welcome to all of you. Um, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement? Okay, thank you very much, Convener, and thanks to the Committee for the opportunity to contribute to the investigation uh, into Scotland's economic performance, uh, I think, since 2007, and also looking at divergence in performance between Scotland, the UK, and its regions and other countries. And I would welcome the scope of the Committee's inquiry. I know that the Committee has taken evidence uh, covering a wide range of areas and subjects relating to Scotland's economic performance. Uh, and at the end of this process, I look forward to receiving the recommendations on what further action might be required to make Scotland's economy even more inclusive, innovative and international. If I can just start by setting out Scotland's recent economic performance before turning to the broader economic outlook and some of the challenges. So Scotland's economic performance strengthened through 2017 with four quarters of growth recorded. That's been driven by growth in services and, importantly, production with sectors supporting the oil and gas sector beginning to return to growth uh, as the outlook for that sector continues to improve. The aggregate growth for Scotland, albeit still below trend, is important against a backdrop of heightened uncertainty as the UK moves closer to leaving the EU. Alongside the growth, Scotland's labour market remains strong and over the past year unemployment has fallen to near record lows. Employment has risen and inactivity has fallen. The labour market in aggregate is performing at near record levels, which is welcome, although it also acknowledged an element of underemployment within those figures as well. Over the past decade, GDP in Scotland has grown 6.5%, averaging just 0.7% growth each year, compared with 1.1% for the UK. Part of the difference in economic performance with the UK reflects differences in population growth. When we make comparisons with the UK economy, it's important to note the unbalanced nature of the UK economy um, and the fact that some UK economic statistics are skewed by the impact that London has in dominating economic performance. I've heard it referred to as uh, the UK economy as flying on one engine. It is so uh, unbalanced, perhaps the most unbalanced developed economy in the world. Since 2007, Scotland's economic performance has outperformed many of our peers, so productivity growth since 2007 has been higher than any other country or region of the UK, including London. Employment in Scotland is now 66,000 higher than it at its pre-recession peak, and there has been considerable progress in reducing youth unemployment, with Scotland now having one of the lowest rates in the EU. And latest figures also show that GDP per head in Scotland is higher than anywhere else in the UK outside of London and the south east of England. So these facts demonstrate the economic progress that has been made under this government. And the past decade covers a period, of course, of the global financial crisis and the deepest global recession since the 1930s. It's not surprising, therefore, that Scottish GDP growth over that period is below the pre-recession trend of growth of around 2.1% each year. Scotland is not unlike other advanced economies in that respect. Trend growth internationally has also been impacted by the financial crisis, with G7 growth averaging 1.1% over the past decade. And there's no question that some of the consequences of the global recession and the UK government's subsequent austerity programme have limited economic growth in Scotland. And since the EU referendum in 2016, there's been ongoing uncertainty for businesses and households. 
The fall in the oil price in 2014 led to a slowdown in the oil and gas supply chain and fed through to the wider Scottish economy, accounting for around two-thirds of the slowdown in overall growth between 2014 and 2016. And there's also another underlying factor that I'm well aware has had a limiting effect on growth, and that is the fact that Scotland's working age population hasn't grown as fast as other countries. This is a challenge that Scotland has faced for many decades and has been exacerbated by Brexit. And that's why we've repeatedly called for Scotland to have the power to tailor its own migration policy to reflect the challenges that we face. On the economic outlook, independent forecasts for the Scottish economy suggest that GDP will grow by between 0.7% and 1.4% in 2018 and accelerate in 2019. There is consensus from all these independent forecasters that the uncertainty surrounding Brexit is a key risk affecting the economic outlook, although there still continue to be some Brexit deniers that deny that this has an impact on the economic outlook. There is no doubt that risks relating to business and consumer sentiment remain, and these are impacting on expenditure and investment in the economy. The improved outlook relative to 2017 reflects in part a stronger world economy. In its latest World Economic Outlook, the IMF was clear that the world economy is enjoying a period of strong economic growth. The IMF has raised its forecast for growth for the world economy for this year and next by 0.2 percentage points above its forecast in October 2017. And the IMF has also upgraded its forecast for the advanced economies by 0.5 and 0.4 percentage points in 2018 and 19, respectively. The UK is the only member of the group of seven leading countries not to have its growth forecast upgraded. And the recent UK data for quarter one 2018 reported growth of 0.1 per cent, which was below market expectations, also below the previous, uh, growth, uh, previous quarter growth uh, in the Scottish economy of 0.3 per cent. Also, as I noted in my earlier remarks, there is a more positive outlook for oil and gas and related production facilities, sorry, production activities, and this should also help uh, drive productivity growth. But support is needed to maximise the longevity and success of this dynamic industry, and the UK industrial strategy has failed to mention any new developments in the oil and gas sector. There is clearly an upside to future prospects for economic growth, but we must be alert to the potential downside from the unpredictable post-Brexit environment. We're just under 12 months away from formally exiting the EU without a clearly agreed path in terms of our ongoing access to key EU markets. And that remains the biggest uncertainty, hampering economic growth and investment over the coming years. In fact, I would argue it's already had an impact on investment. It's also virtually universally acknowledged that Brexit will damage our long-term economic growth, also damaging productivity investment and trade. And related to that, of course, with Scotland's working age population projected to grow only slightly over the next 25 years, a Brexit-induced decline in EU migrants will have a damaging impact on our economy. So the economic outlook is perhaps inevitably uncertain, but I want to emphasise that the Scottish economy is facing the future from a position of relative economic strength. Despite the uncertainties, we are supporting business and continuing to grow Scotland's economy by focusing on investment, internationalisation, innovation and inclusive growth. And there are many positive results from these actions. Scotland has secured more FDI investment projects than any other part of the UK outside London since 2007. These investments have supported 38,000 jobs in Scotland and are a vote of confidence in the economy. The Scottish Government is clear that we remain open to investment from the rest of the UK, Europe and from further afield. We have established a board of trade and created hubs in Dublin, London and Berlin. Our international goods exports, including oil and gas, grew 19% last year to £28.8 billion, the fastest growth of any of the UK nations. We are also investing £48 million in our National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland in Renfrewshire, with Strathclyde as the anchor university. And we have invested over £6 billion in the higher education sector over the last six years. Business expenditure on research and development exceeded £1 billion for the first time in 2016, up almost 70% in real terms since 2007. We have also increased free high-quality early learning and childcare. That has been uh, to 600 uh, hours a year for all three- and four-year-olds, up from 475 hours in 2007. And Scotland remains the best performing of all four UK countries, with the highest proportion of employees paid the living wage or more at 81.6%. 
We're building on the successes of our enterprise and skills agencies, developing a system of support that's greater than the sum of its parts. A strategic board is now in place and will seek to maximise the impact of the collective investment we make in enterprise and skills development, and also to create the conditions for delivering inclusive growth. We're creating a new enterprise agency in the south of Scotland with an interim economic partnership in place, backed with £10 million of investment. And we have a detailed implement implementation plan to establish a Scottish National Investment Bank to be a new cornerstone institution in Scotland's economic landscape. And we have undertaken to provide an initial capitalisation of £340 million from 2019-20. Now, having said all that, Convener, there are undoubtedly key challenges that the economy will face in the next 10 years and beyond. We are alive to these challenges, challenges of automation and technology, but also to the opportunities that they will bring as well. The recent joint report with the STUC on the impact of technological changes on Scottish jobs set out how digitisation, automation and other innovations will affect the Scottish labour market. And we share a common objective with the STUC to ensure automation and digitisation have positive outcomes for all of Scotland's people. There is one very significant challenge that is self-evident, that's that key economic power remains devolved um, or reserved to the UK government. These include things like the national minimum wage, national insurance and migration powers. And incidentally, the national minimum wage is what stops the Scottish Government from making uh, a legal requirement or a contractual requirement of the uh, living wage. If you already have, under EU law, a national minimum wage, you cannot then impose a higher uh, wage for procurement purposes. Further powers, though, would allow us to invest in Scotland's economy and infrastructure, rather than being tied to the UK Government's hard Brexit and austerity policies. And although the UK Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy recently acknowledged in the House of Commons that he accepts that he has responsibility for growth in the economies of all the nations of the UK, the UK Government really needs to engage in a meaningful way with the Scottish Government on the industrial strategy. So, Convener, these are my views on the central issues in Scotland's economic performance. Finally, I believe we now have a more resilient economy than in 2007, not least as evidenced by the way it's dealt with one of the biggest shocks to any economy for many decades. Uh, and our ambition remains with regard to improving our economic, social and environmental outcomes as set out in the National Performance Framework. And I look forward to the Committee's further uh, forthcoming recommendations from their inquiry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And you've touched on a, a very wide range of issues, and I think uh, committee members will be following up and asking more about some of these. Uh, if any of your team are wanting to come in at any point, if you just indicate, I will try and uh, bring you in as well. So if I can just start off with uh, one or two questions myself. You've mentioned a number of things uh, that are happening, have happened and will happen in the economy, but in particular, there were purpose targets set in 2007 for the coming 10 years, which are now complete. And I just wonder if you could give us some thoughts about how the economy has really performed over the last 10 years. You said it was more resilient, eh, but there are some specific things like, for example, to raise the GDP growth rate to the UK level to match the GDP growth rate of small independent EU countries. How, how do you feel we've done on some of these specific things? I think there's a number of those targets, some of which you refer to, Convener, which um, we have met. There are a number which we've not met, uh, and there are a number which we've made progress towards meeting. But I do think these were set in 2007, and of course, since that period, we've had a huge uh, recession, um, some say the biggest ever recession. And of course, that's been followed on now by eight years of austerity. Austerity inevitably has an impact on demand in the economy, consumer spending and consumer confidence. So I think those targets, having been set, were then um, hit by, or the ability to achieve those targets was hit by more general economic circumstances. I'm not making this stuff up. Everybody knows that from their own lived experience. But to come back to some of the um, points that you've raised uh, and some of the targets which you've referred to, uh, Convener. The target to match the GDP growth rate of small independent EU countries by 2017, that's not been met, although the gap has narrowed. Uh, in the 10 years to 2007, Scotland's average growth rate was 1.1 percentage points behind the small EU countries. In 27, that gap is almost halved, 2.6 percentage points. Uh, we also had a target to rank in the top quartile for productivity against our key trading partners by 2017. The performance that we've had has not reached that target, but it's consistent on this measure, moving between the bottom of the second quartile and the top of the third quartile. We've not made 
Uh, I think I'm perfectly willing to admit the step change required, and hence the additional focus through the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board. But we have made some progress. So between 2007 and 16, our productivity growth has been higher than any other country or region of the UK, including London. Uh, and although productivity, labour productivity growth in Scotland has slowed over the last decade, this trend has been seen in many countries since the economic downturn. Uh, and I think Scotland's performance has been comparable to our key trading partners. Uh, a, a number of other targets were also set, things, for example, convener like the um, trying to match the average European population growth from 2007 to 17. Um, so we, we have met that target. The population of Scotland has increased each year since 2001 is now at its highest uh, ever level at £5.42 million, although that stands beside the comment I made in my opening statement that uh, we would like to have control over that, especially for emerging trends um, related to Brexit, where we're seeing people either leaving or choosing not to come to Scotland or the UK. That may be something which suits the UK. I would argue it probably doesn't suit the UK, but that's for the UK to decide. It certainly doesn't suit the economy uh, in Scotland. So there's been a mix of targets have been achieved, some have not been achieved. I think all have been affected by pretty global um, circumstances in terms of the recession, austerity, and of course the downturn 2014 in the price of oil and gas. Thanks very much. I mean, one of the ones was the raising the GDP growth rate to the UK level. And I mean, you, you yourself already said this morning that the UK has got a bit pretty unbalanced economy. It's got one engine in many ways. Should we be comparing with the UK as a whole, or should we be comparing with other, you know, sizable chunks like the north of England? Because can we really compare with the southeast of England at all? I think it's a good point to convene. I'll say that if we set the target, then we have to be held to account for the target that we set. The government has to be held to that. So we have to have that comparison between Scotland and the UK. But I think in the last two or three years, we've seen a much more rounded um, assessment, which is based on a comparison between other uh, regions and nations of the UK. And I think in that context, Scotland in different criteria, either sits right amongst the average uh, of um, countries and regions of the UK, or it's well above and usually sits behind um, uh, the South East and London. Um, all of which points to the fact that we have a grossly imbalanced economy in the UK and a, an extremely unequal one, perhaps the most unequal um, economy, e even in some respects greater than the US in terms of its inequality. So we have a, a dysfunctional economy in the UK. Um, if you go to the north um, east or northwest of England, if you go to the Midlands to some extent, if you go to Wales, people will um, say the same thing. It's not the way to run an economy. And London sucking in resources and talent the way it does at the expense of other parts of the UK um, is a difficulty. So I think in order to make a proper assessment, first of all, we have to be kept to the targets that we set. And I, I accept that in terms of a comparison between Scotland and the UK. But similarly, to get a proper assessment of that, and I think you've had that in some of the discussions uh, during your inquiry, convener, you have to look at other parts of the UK as well, and that does leave you to an assessment. It's a very unequal and, to some extent, dysfunctional economy. Thanks very much. I think Gillian Martin has a supplementary on this point. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I was really interested to look at some of the commentary around the gross na national income statistics that came out a couple of weeks ago. And um, would you say that one of the, the commentaries around it was around the outflow of income going out from Scotland, that Scotland's producing a sizable amount of income, but a lot of it's flowing out of Scotland. I mean, is that, uh, oil and gas, of course, is an ind a major indicator of that, a lot of revenue produced from oil and gas, but it's actually going out with Scotland. Is that making it um, more imbalanced as a result? Yes, although I think it's also true to say that will be a factor for other parts of the UK as well. Um, so I saw, I just happened to see a graph this morning with the ownership of supermarkets. Uh, I think it was Denmark compared to Scotland and the number of uh, supermarkets owned, I think it was Denmark, um, in Denmark, pretty substantial, none uh, in Scotland um, in terms of the big supermarkets. So. There is that outflow, and that comes from being um, in a poorer position in relation to uh, headquarter functions, and we've seen that trend that's been there for many years, um, including uh, decades, really, of headquarters being taken towards um, the southeast, and in particular London. 
Um, so that, that is a fact. And of course, with those headquarters tend to go headquarters jobs um, as much as any income raised by those companies, which in any event goes to the Exchequer, um, it's those jobs, those high value jobs um, that can be detrimental to the economy. And it is another facet of what is a very imbalanced economy. And I think Scotland could do far better than to be tied to that kind of economy. Thank you. Um, thank you. I mean, continuing to look back at the last 10 years, could, could you highlight, you think, one or two or maybe even three uh, government policies that you feel have made a really positive impact over the last 10 years? Yeah, I think there's a number. So um, the small business bonus scheme, for example, I think has had a, a major impact. And I think that would be, uh, and we're about to do some analysis on that. I think it's not so much in my portfolio as more to do with the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance um, to bottom out the evidence basis for that. But I know from my own constituency, I would assume other members would know that during the teeth of the recession, the small business bonus scheme had the effect of allowing, especially uh, as its name suggests, small businesses to either survive uh, through that period or to keep a, a member of staff perhaps that they would otherwise not have kept because of cost pressures or to take on a new member of staff or even an apprentice um, because of the savings made from um, the rates. So I think that's been a very substantial um, support. And of course, it's very particularly delighted at the Scottish economy, given that 98% of our, of our companies are SMEs. So I think that has been um, a major boon uh, to the Scottish economy. I think also the focus that we've had uh, latterly in terms of the living wage has produced benefits. So uh, we have, uh, of the countries of the UK, the highest proportion of people paid the living wage, 81.6%, as I said, uh, in my uh, opening uh, remarks. I think that has been very uh, beneficial. Um, and I think the other thing, again, going back to the, the worst of the recession, but we're still seeing the benefits from that in terms of the employment figures, is our um, decision back in 2011-12, I think it was, to have a no compulsory redundancy policy. And the reason for that wasn't just to keep people in jobs, important that was, though that was. If you remember at the time, convener, the um, First Minister had mentioned it was partly because we wanted to make sure that people had the confidence and know their job was safe. Now, of course, that was accompanied by a period of wage restraint, um, which we're only now starting to see people coming out of that wage restraint. But it did mean that people had the confidence to know that it would still be uh, in their job. And I think that was really important for demand uh, in, in the economy. And also, in terms of some of the stuff we've done uh, for training, uh, opportunities for all, the guarantee of a place in training or an apprenticeship for all 16 to 19-year-olds. If you remember, we had a, a real high in terms of uh, youth unemployment back in the early part of this decade. And to turn that around to, as I mentioned in the opening statement, one of the lowest uh, in the EU and below the UK, I think, has been a... Um, a, a real boost and it's one of those things that you perhaps don't appreciate so much when you have it but if you don't have it and if you have like Spain huge numbers of young people um, uh, unemployed that's a major generational problem for society so I think we have done a number of things which have helped to mitigate the effects of some of the shocks on the economy. That's great thanks and the final area I wanted just to touch on is looking forward you, you mentioned a few things looking forward you mentioned Brexit, so we'll leave that just now because other people will come onto that later. But you also mentioned something like automation. Uh, so what other risks and challenges do you think we particularly face in the next 10 years? I think in terms of automation um, and digitisation, I think those, of course, can mean, and even um, things like uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, just if you take that one example, so... Um, uh, and also related to that, low carbon vehicles, uh, there are issues that are thrown up in terms of what do you do with vehicle excise duty? Um, if you have um, autonomous vehicles, what does that mean for certain services that are currently provided by uh, buses and taxis? Um, what does it mean for those that train to be drivers if autonomous vehicles include as they're bound to do? Uh, autonomous uh, vehicles transporting freight, what does that mean for the people employed in those industries? So this uh, throws up um, some major questions. And also, more generally, if you think of, I think the Japanese have, I don't sure how you, how you describe it, but an AI 
uh, on one of their boards, an artificial intelligence on one of the boards of one of the companies. Uh, that gives you an example of the way that things are changing and the role of people in um, the economy can be changing as well. So what we've done in relation to that, convener, is we've established with the um, STUC a just transition uh, group, which is to look at how we can manage these processes, but still make sure that uh, people are not the ones that pay the price for this in terms of jobs or fulfilling work. But it's quite clear that uh, autom autom automation, uh, digitisation, uh, and the growth of artificial intelligence and the growth of use of data will have an impact on uh, the labour market and our economies. But they also, I think, very importantly represent opportunities, which we've done a great deal to try and maximise our benefit from. So uh, in terms of Edinburgh University and associated universities, the data centre and data lab that's there now has an international reputation. So I think it does, it does um, mean there are threats which are there, but it's also true there are real uh, benefits. And one of the other problems which I did briefly allude to in my opening statement, convener, in relation to challenges, is the demographic one. Um, you know, we're, we are facing uh, still an ageing workforce. It seems axiomatic to me that we should be trying to bolster that workforce by being a f an open country in terms of uh, migrant uh, labour, which has been a real boost to Scotland. Um, and again, that's a challenge if, um, and I won't go back to Brexit, I know as you've said, we're going to come back to that, but if there's a tightening of the ability for us to have people come to this country, especially in s sectors like hospitality uh, and retail and agriculture, then that's going to have an effect as well. That's great. Thanks so much. Well, it's a fascinating idea that the Japanese companies have AI on their board. We can maybe try that in the committees as well. Um, right, the next question is from Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Cabinet Secretary, we, we've obviously had a lot of focus on productivity, um, and that's been identified as a key to Scotland's long-term economic growth potential. And you've touched on a number of elements of that. But one of the key things that I look at here that I see we've heard in previous evidence is, for example, growth of GDP per head between 2007 and 2017 is 1.5% in Scotland versus 3.5% in the UK as a whole. And we've also had evidence that very little progress has been made in narrowing the productivity gap between Scotland and the best performing countries. And there are other examples of success within that, but broadly speaking, that's the evidence that's come out. Very simply, why are we lagging behind other countries? Yeah, I, I notice this is a question that the committee members have asked of many of the people you've had appearing before you, and I don't think from my review of the evidence anybody's come up with a definitive answer, but they do tend to uh, focus around issues like uh, skills, of course, uh, innovation, um, also the quality of management, I think, is a very important issue. There's a lot more focus on that these days. Uh, quality of leadership in the workplace. Um, the level of business um, R&D is a key factor there as well. I'm very pleased, as I mentioned in the opening statement, to see that go above a billion pounds for a first year. But that has been a real uh, long tail of underinvestment in terms of business uh, investment. So I, I, I'm afraid I can't give you one uh, reason for it. I think we have seen over 5% growth in productivity, well above what the UK itself has achieved, but we still lag, although slightly now, behind the UK, and the UK, as you quite rightly say, still lags behind uh, other economies. And so I think we, um, you know, in terms of trying to uh, change the, the, the nature of the productivity issue, or the productivity puzzle it's often called, uh, is by focusing on those areas, the Enterprise and Skills Review sought to do that, um, things like the National Manufacturing um, Centre of Excellence will also s seek to try and achieve uh, change in relation to productivity as well. I don't think there is, and I think this is borne out by the evidence that you previously heard, uh, one um, silver bullet that will do this. But it might be useful to hear from uh, the Chief Economist in relation to that as well, if, if the committee is happy. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh... I, I was reading over the evidence last night, and there was quite a lot of different views on the productivity puzzle. I think, as Mr Brown has said, first and foremost, it's not a Scottish or UK thing. It's actually reflected in the data for the OECD and the EU15. So, uh, uh, in the context of Scotland, there's quite interesting evidence in the period from 2000 to 2007. We had a productivity growth rate average about 1.2%, and at the time, the UK was growing at closer to 2%, so we lagged in that period. But interestingly, from 2007 to 16, the growth in Scotland has been around 0.8%, compared with broadly flat in terms of the UK. So there's something happened in the in the second 
the second part of that that period, and we are actually closer to the OECD average in the EU. But I suppose, w w what does it all mean in the round? So productivity, in a sense, is a whole system measure. It's measuring, it's, th this specific measure uh, captures the value added per hour work, and in a sense it reflects much wider, it reflects the whole, the whole productivity of the system, and by that I mean more than just the economy. But if I can just pick up on some factors that may have contributed to this. So there's different arguments around what has driven it. I think the financial crisis is a plausible argument about what happened to the banking sector and whether there was an adverse supply side shock, which led to different types of function of the provision of credit and also impacted in the churn of businesses within the sector. This, this idea of kind of zombie firms being kept, kept afloat. Uh, linked to that, We've seen evidence and heard evidence, evidence around weak private investment in the Scottish economy, the extent to which that's driven by the banking sector, provision of finance, or, or the types of enterprises that we've had. Also, I think you heard in your evidence quite a difference in the performance of sectors, both in terms of productivity, so you have high value added sectors, like the utilities, energy, business financial services, uh, to slightly lower value added sectors like retail or tourism. But what was really interesting is within the sectors there's quite a range of performance. So there's something about uh, not all firms performing at the higher level. I think Mr Brown's touched on kind of fair work, utilisation of skills in the workplace as well. There's something about retraining. And I think one other thing I would mention is the, the kind of debate around inequality as well and the extent to which inequality contributes to uh, less productive societies. I think Sir Harry Burns, when he was here giving evidence, touched on essentially um, the productive value of all people in society. And if people are excluded or don't participate, then essentially that underlines, undervalues the productive kind of possibility of the economy. So. So there's no single answer for this, but it's a, it's a combination of, of all things that, that inter, interlink in terms of driving productivity. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Uh, one thing that, uh, as a fairly new member of this committee, I've been actually quite interested in is all the, well, the figures around GDP and so on, they don't seem to be solid figures. There's an awful lot of extrapolation and, uh, frankly, to me, guesswork in producing them. How accurate are they actually? It's a very good question. And this committee, of course, has carried out its investigation into um, economic statistics. And um, it, I think that the, the short answer I would say to Mr Beattie is that they are complicated. So we produce some a number of economic stats ourselves. Uh, ONS provide quite a lot of the stats, and some of the stats that we provide are a combination of both. So, for example, in relation to um, export figures, I think we have to wait until almost a year after um, in order to get the last figures from the UK. I think it's the Department of Energy. Energy is the last set of figures that we get to put into those. I think that's on exports um, before we can actually put that. Now, I, I don't think... It may be useful to have figures from over a year ago, but we need to have more up-to-date information. And one of the things that we've done is through the establishment of the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board to uh, put in place an analytical unit with Stephen Boyle, from, formerly from RBS, um, looking at exactly what the quality and the range of stats that we have, because um, the underlying point, I think, which is, is being made is that unless you have real confidence in the range and the relevance of the stats which you're provided with, you can't take the right decisions on the economy. So I think, by and large, there is integrity within those figures. It's whether they're always uh, timious enough. A lot of them um, are based on surveys and sometimes a boost that we pay for to UK surveys. Um, so, uh, for example, it's quite a different situation in Northern Ireland where they oblige all companies to report back on these things. We haven't gone down that route. So I think uh, I do accept uh, greater consistency uh, and also relevance. So there's a, a measure which many countries do called the whole of the economy report, which we don't do in this country. It's worth looking at that as well. So I think we can rely, and it'd be best, to, I think, to hear from the experts in relation to this, we can rely on the figures that we've got, but we shouldn't be complacent that they're always the most uh, relevant uh, or up-to-date or couldn't be improved. Which is, so GDP 
essentially measures the the value of goods and services produced in the in the quarter. And if you think about that, there's 380,000 enterprises. Within 100 days of the last quarter, we're producing an estimate of the change in the total output, income or expenditure in the economy. And given the time scale and the fact that you have to draw on survey evidence, which is then imputed for the wider economy, it is an estimate. But the estimates have been shown to be relatively robust. They're subject to revision. As, as we get better data, as companies' turnover and profits are formally published and audited, then you get better data. But generally, our GDP data in the UK and Scotland is amongst the best in the EU and is the most timely. But I can understand the frustration around uh, different sectors within it. People have picked up on construction trends within Scotland. But generally, the methodology, the approach, and, and how it's actually conveyed is, is really strong in Scotland, and I have no concerns at all about it. Cabinet Secretary, in your opening statement, you made the comment about uh, population growth south of the border driving the productivity figures there to a certain extent. When we're comparing Scotland with the rest of the UK, do we try and strip these figures out? Do we try and adjust for them or not? I think, uh, that, well, again, the, the statisticians will be able to answer, but they do try and account for them um, and the extent to which GDP figures are intrinsically linked to population growth, um, I think, is well evident. So we do understand that point. And I think there are ways in which you can, uh, you mentioned stripping out, you can do that, I think, by um, some measures that you have. Again, perhaps best if the Gary was able to speak to that. But yes, we do account for it. We understand that we have lower population growth and have had for um, decades, even centuries, than um, the rest of the UK. And we do try and account for that, not least because we want to try and make the point that if we could have more control over what our population is, and particularly in relation to immigration, then we could make uh, an impact. So it is, it is accounted for. I don't know if Gary wants to come back on that as well. Yeah, you, you can, uh, Kavina, break it down into three elements. Uh, productivity, participation and population. And actually, we've done analysis within government, which I've published in the State of the Economy. So if you look at, I think Mr Brown said that Scottish average growth rate over the last 10 years was 0.7 and the UK was 1.1. So you can break that into the contribution from productivity, participation and population. And what you would see is that the UK growth will have been underpinned around a third of that by population. In Scotland, that will be maybe 15 to 20 per cent. Productivity, a smaller piece, and participation, the other element. So if you think of an aggregate, a, a grown population brings more people out of the economy, boosts aggregate demand, and essentially makes this, the size of the economy bigger. It doesn't necessarily make it more productive, but it boosts the size. So a shrinking economy, less people, would mean a smaller economy. And that's why we focus on GDP per capita, our output per hour work to try and control for differences in the size of the economy. But population in itself is a growth is a driver of, of growth in the economy. Right. I don't, I don't want to push the time too much, but can you make this the final question? Okay. Just, um, just to move on to a slightly different aspect. We've heard evidence that uh, Scottish uh, businesses lack ambition in their growth. And obviously that's a key concern if we're trying to improve GDP. Would you agree with that? And how do we tackle that? I was talking to, um, I think, the person in charge of the CBI in Scotland recently, and she made the point that um, she felt there was quite a, a level of that. So companies which are satisfied with the markets that they have don't necessarily want to go into exporting or even necessarily expansion. And that's perfectly legitimate. We can't tell companies they should grow in this way or that way. If they're happy with what they do, they know the market, they know their products. But we do want to try and encourage um, those companies that perhaps have been inhibited from being involved in exporting or further expansion or scaling up. <coughs> a typical example that's given is a family business where they know they have, if you like, succession planning in place and they know their market and they want to stay in that market and basically do what they've been doing up till now. So, and that might have an effect, but that would be true of any economy in the world. You'll get that um, um, that trait uh, amongst those. So what we're trying to do is try and increase the number of companies. For example, the export, sometimes there's been a cultural resistance to it by the feeling that it's um, intrinsically difficult. You have to speak different languages to do it. There's bureaucracy involved. So we've done a lot uh, sometimes with the UK government in trying to dispel some of these um, 
uh, some of these um, inhibitions. And also, I suppose, um, I've often asked if there's a benefit to Brexit and struggle to think what it might be, but if the very public discussion that we're having about international trade also acts as a, a way of making uh, more obvious to people the benefits of international trade uh, because of the debate around Brexit, then that, that should be a good thing. So, yes, it is there in the economy, um, and, and also perhaps even exacerbated by... Uh, the relative peripherality of, of Scotland's geographical situation, but that would also apply to Ireland. Um, so we do try and overcome this, and that's why we've done what we've done in relation to innovation, uh, the business support that we've done in terms of enterprise and skills, trying to make it as focused as possible on uh, internationalisation, investment and innovation. It's definitely there, um, but we're trying to overcome it. Thanks so much. Uh, if I can move on to Dean Lockhart. Just now. Uh, thank, thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just to follow up on that point about the uh, growth of Scottish business and, and microeconomic policy, for example, the large business supplement, do you think which applies for companies which grow above a certain level, they then have to pay significantly higher uh, levels of rates? And we heard during evidence in the committee that that, for example, is one policy that does act as a barrier for growth. Do, do, do you see that uh, concern? Uh, well, I think the Various measures that we take and have to be taken in the balance, so um, the supplements um, should be taken around with what we do for small businesses. Uh, and I think it's um, a right that governments do have uh, a basket of measures that they can take. Um, and, uh, you know, that largely affects uh, the retail sector, amongst others, and uh, the retail sector will tell you, uh, I'm sure they've told you, they've certainly told me, that their biggest um, concern is disposable um, income in the economy. So people have money to spend to buy their goods is a, is a big factor. And I accept that. And um, so, for example, we've reduced the lowest rate of taxation um, to the lowest rate in the UK now um, and take a number of uh, other measures. But if you take that in tandem with what we're doing in terms of fair work, so the national um, living wage being, if you like, um, uh, our preferences for the, the real living wage. Now, if you do that, and if some of these companies that are doing that employ people, and most of them now do, uh, on the real living wage, that increases the disposable income uh, in the economy. And therefore, uh, if you're being paid uh, the living wage, you're using it by definition to live on. So you're buying those goods and services in those companies. So I think it is, uh, of course, it's on the case nobody likes paying taxes or, or rates, uh, but I think we have a balanced approach which uh, should help uh, not least that sector, but other sectors as well, achieve growth. I don't think it is an inhibition on growth when taken together. OK, that... Sure, sure. Go Mr ahead. Gillespie. I was just going to make a point, I suppose, in a sense, linking back to the last question about lack of ambition. I suppose the growth in self-employed and the, the arguments around lifestyle businesses. But actually, when you look at the composition of our enterprises, the UK and Scotland, we tend to have less of the medium-sized businesses, so we're dominated by the large and the small, and there might be something around actually growing more medium-sized businesses, which would be the engines or driver of growth in, in that context. So there's something around that factually which is worth adding to the record. Ms McCallum. Could I just add in? I think one of the things that's that, stru that structure of the economy point is really important. And if you look at the things that we are trying to do in terms of innovation, what we're trying to do is we're trying to support innovation coming out of the universities and across into business with the various innovation centres that we have. But we're also trying to make sure that business spend on innovation and research and development is as high as it can be. And it's not been uh, as good uh, historically as the uh, university sector has. You know, if you compare them, the business spend spend is very much lower. Um, so what we're trying to do is to encourage that by providing support. So we give about, we've been given about 22 million to SE to help businesses invest in um, research and development. And we've, we've upped that by 15 million per annum for the next three years. And we've got a target of trying to double um, the, the, the investment that business makes in its own um, its own innovation and that's not necessarily the eureka type innovation it can be process innovation it can be a company understanding how it might actually just run its business better and to some extent we are worried actually about a long tail of companies who are out there um, and who perhaps feel that they're doing perfectly well but actually are not doing the kind of things that would allow them to, to grow faster. And that can sometimes be because they don't want to, but it can sometimes be because they don't know how to do other things. Um, and so there is a challenge for us, both in terms of investment and knowledge and support and information to help those businesses um, operate differently. Dean Locker. 
th thanks very much. I mean, I think there is a consensus here in the sense of needing to scale up a number of the, the, the SMEs who are currently small and move them to that to that medium uh, area. And to the extent we can remove barriers to that, uh, in, in addition to helping them uh, from a public sector perspective, to the extent we can remove barriers in their journey to scaling up, I think that would be a, a really uh, important policy uh, priority. Um, perhaps I can move on to policy, some policy questions. Du during the evidence session, we heard from the strategic board and others about some of the performance gaps relating to the 4i um, uh, targets in relation to inclusive growth, innovation, internationalization and, and investment. We also heard evidence of a, a, a lack of policy focus and, and clarity o over where policy uh, may, may be heading. And Cabinet Secretary, given that, I, I wondered if you could explain whether you have any um, uh, plans to review economic policy, the 4i economic policy or otherwise, in terms of what the Scottish Government's economic policy is? I think in terms of the 4i's, we think that remains uh, relevant and um, a good focus to steer the economy by. But I think part of the, the rest of your question, and I know you've phrased this separately in the Chamber, is on the quite complicated landscape that we have um, in Scotland. Now, if you go back to the Enterprise and Skills Review and the establishment of the Strategic Board, which you mentioned, I've said right the way through that, that part of what it should be about achieving is a decluttering of the landscape. Um, so, <clears throat> and I've asked that they continue on with that process. Now, it's not just, it is very often, but not just the Scottish Government that um, puts buildings, if you like, or structures in that landscape. The UK Government does that as well, and sometimes we do it jointly in, in relation to city deals. So I do think there is scope for further uh, clarity, really from the point of view of the user, the businesses, or those who want to establish businesses being uh, clearer. So that process started under the Enterprise and Skills Review will continue, and that should provide greater clarity. But on, in relation to the four eyes, uh, we remain committed to, to those and think they are uh, relevant to the um, way we want to see the economy going. Okay. Thanks very much. You mentioned uh, the UK industrial strategy. Could I ask what, what steps, uh, specific steps, uh, is the Scottish Government taking to work together with the UK Government to identify uh, opportunities for Scottish business through the, the sector deals, the Innovation Challenge Fund and the other um, funding available under the UK industrial strategy? Uh, well, first of all, we've been very keen to be partners in this. Um, not easy when you're sent the industrial strategy on a Saturday night and it's been published on the following Monday, um, despite previous assurances that we would be treated as partners in this. Not easy also when the sector deals, which to be fair are often led by the industry themselves, do not involve a Scottish component until we bring it to the attention of the UK government or the sector brings it to the attention uh, of the UK government. That is improving somewhat and I'm very grateful that Lord Henley, I think it is. One of the ministers in the department has recently agreed to rerun one of the sector deals because he acknowledged there wasn't sufficient involvement from the sector in Scotland. So I think we have had a number of discussions, including a recent one I had with um, the Secretary of State, where we agreed to meet um, on a regular basis to discuss this. I think because of some of the representations that we have made to the UK government and to um, Innovation UK as well, we've now seen the take up um, in terms of the quantum of monies being much better for Scotland, so up to about 14% of some of the available funds, but it's still our concern that's coming from too narrow a base in Scotland, um, so I've made that point to the UK Government. And officials participate in regular calls, they have them uh, on a regular basis with UK counterparts. I think the other thing as well, we've said to the UK Government that really to see the whole picture of what the industrial strategy will do, we also have to have some clarity about the Shared Prosperity Fund which is now becoming very pressing. So we have a group established between ourselves and the UK government, the Scottish Business Growth Group, uh, which is attended by myself and usually um, uh, Ian Duncan. And a very strong representations at the most recent meeting to say that we have to have some clarity. Shared prosperity, which will be the successor to many of the um, European structural and other funds which are currently available, is very important to businesses. We're about 10 months away from the 
um, Brexit date and people still don't even know uh, the basis on what the shared prosperity funding uh, will be delivered. And that's very important to lots of businesses. So I think we do have dialogue. It's improved since the establishment or the announcement of the UK industrial strategy. We make re regular representations on it. I speak with and write to the Secretary of State and officials collaborate with UK officials as well. Um, one, one final question, if I may. Um, in relation to social enterprise, which, I, again, I think there was some um, consensus around the importance of social enterprise and uh, increasing uh, focus being put on that, there was some concern expressed by the sector itself that the definition of what is a social enterprise and what may or may not be included as a social enterprise is, is slightly confused. I th um, the, 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 there are guidelines, but there's no statutory definition of what a social enterprise is. And s many people, some of the evidence indicated that was a barrier to um, growth in the social enterprise sector. Cabinet Secretary, I wondered if you recognise that that is an issue, or perhaps one of your colleagues might want to give us their thoughts on, on, on that issue. I think I will do that, and they can choose between themselves which one is going to be the lucky one. But I, I would say that I have not had um, that representation. I'm not saying it's not there, but certainly I've not had representations along those lines to me. But I don't know who wants to come in. Is it Mary? Is it you? Yeah. Well, I'll, I, I'm not sure I can comment. I, I'm 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 not sure I can comment in the detail of that because, to be honest, I don't deal a lot with social enterprises. But I do know that the government, over many years, has put a lot of effort into working with social enterprise. Um, to having a social enterprise strategy. Scottish Enterprise have a, an element of their functionality, which is about supporting sp social enterprise. And I think, if I remember correctly, Business Gateway also have that. Um, but I think on that question of statutory uh, identity, um, I, it would depend on which legislation actually it's founded in. If it's founded in Scottish legislation, then that's obviously something for us to look at. If it's founded in company law or something that's reserved to the UK, we would have to think about that on a UK wide basis um, and I think that um, social enterprise I suppose in its nature by its very nature it's a more um, it's a, it's a, it's not ambivalent is the wrong word because it sounds as if it's a pejorative comment and it's not intended to be that at all um, but it is much more difficult to define because it actually um, it, it actually has that wider dimension and last but not least of course we have a, a, an enterprise agency in the Highlands and Islands which has actually as a part of its remit um, a, a, a role in terms of community enterprise and indeed a account manages some communities in the Highlands and certainly works with social enterprises in that space. And it's something that's also being considered as part of the work to set up the South of Scotland, forthcoming South of Scotland agency. It, now, we are getting very full answers and I know it's very helpful for the committee in our report and things, but uh, we're, we're kind of halfway through our time and I've only had three uh, of the committee members ask questions. I'm going to take then go on to the other three. I'll take something very brief, Mr Gillespie, if you want to say something. I, I suppose just to say the point that social enterprises are often considered not-for-profit, but actually many of them operate on a profit basis. It's just that they tend to be charities and the profits are reinvested either into local community or assets. So that may be, there may be something in that. And the social enterprise census is really good at giving you a flavour. I think there's over a 1,000 social enterprises in Scotland now employing around 100,000, and they go from the, your housing associations at one point right down, right down to really small enterprises. Right, thanks very much. Um, I mean, it is, uh, I mean, it's helpful that for the full answers we're getting, but I want to give all the committee members an equal chance. So, Gillian Martin now with a few questions. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, in response to one of Dean Lockhart's questions, he, he, he was alluding to a relationship between the Scottish and UK governments with regards to the industrial strategy. Well, we, you'll know that we had Greg Clark in front of us a, a few weeks ago, and he indicated there had been constructive engagement with the Scottish government around the industrial strategy. Some of the questions that I asked him were around the impact of future trade deals post-Brexit. Um, in particular around protected geographical indicators for Scottish produce that, that, that uh, currently they apply to. Um, and he didn't particularly have answers in that regard. Um, it was pointed out how important they were to the Scottish economy. Um, can I ask you what conversations you've had around this with the UK government and, and how much you've, it's been stressed that these are important to, to the Scottish economy? 
Uh, well, the conversations that we've had with the UK government tend not on these issues, tend not to have been through Greg Clark. It tends to be Liam Fox that we made these representations. Um, I, I, I think Greg Clark is right to say it has been, um, it's gone up and down, but it's been largely a constructive discussion with him in particular, um, much less so, I would say, in relation to trade. And also in terms of the geographical indicators, which you quite rightly say are absolutely crucial, uh, whether it's whiskey, smoked salmon, arbol smokies, various things, uh, absolutely crucial to the economy. And if some of the stuff that we're starting to hear about the US's requirements of any trade deal of the UK to give up um, some of these geographical indicators, I think they have a, a phrase about intellectual property rather than... Um, um, the one that's used in the EU, we want to stick with what the EU protections currently are. And I know this is a matter of major concern to some of the trade unions with whom I met recently in relation to this. So we have raised this. I've raised it directly with um, uh, Liam Fox, um, and I think we've raised it in writing and happy to let uh, the committee have copies of that correspondence. Um, you also mentioned that the industrial strategy, the, the future, um, and I've if I heard you right, oil and gas is not mentioned in the future strategy. And of course, food and drink, in one of the trade deals that is underway with Hong Kong, food and drink didn't feature in, in that either. Um, do you feel that Scotland's economy, there's two major strengths of Scot Scotland's economy, are really been taken into consideration as a priority in future trade deals post-Brexit? Are you getting an indication from Liam Fox that they are going to be front and centre of any kind of trade deals? I'm afraid I'm not, and that's not just interactions with Liam Fox. It's just to do with the general confusion around um, uh, what's happening with Brexit when deals are actually going to be struck. I hear this week that um, Liam Fox has said, for example, there could be secret discussions with the US about a trade deal. That That is just not the way, quite literally, to do business. We have to know what's going on and know that our vital industries are protected. Now, the biggest um, food export from Scotland, of course, is um, salmon, and the biggest drink exports, obviously, whisky. But they're also the biggest food and drink exports for the whole of the UK. They're crucial. Uh, we've just seen the new Macallan distillery open, £120, £140 million pounds worth of investment there and a big impact on the economy. If people can produce copies of that at a fraction of the price, that's going to fundamentally undermine our trade. So I don't think we have got those reassurances yet. The trade bill was another one where I got an email through as I was sitting at an SNP conference. That's no way to tell us what the trade bill is going to include. Uh, and of course, it didn't include very much in the end. So uh, we don't have the discussions that we have, uh, that we'd like to have just now with the UK government. It's much less satisfactory than I would say the discussions we're having with Greg Clark um, on the industrial strategy. And incidentally, I met with him just after the committee spoke with him uh, last time. Um, in, in answer to one of my questions, he said that a lot of things that I was asking about were some way down the road, but some way down the road, we're, we're, as you say, we're 10 months away from a Brexit situation. What impact could that have, that uncertainty have on Scotland's economy for those major sectors? Well, I, th I think, you know, just a, a cursory read of any of these newspapers will tell you that uh, it's having an impact already. People deferring investment decisions, um, you know, whether that's in industries which are currently doing very well, but they're uncertain about the future. Um, the relocation of uh, European agencies out with the UK. Um, but if it touches on those absolutely huge parts of the Scottish economy, like uh, whisky uh, and drink and food, then it, it can have uh, an absolutely major effect. Um, and uh, we, you know, the idea there's some way down the line. Well, we're about ten months away uh, from Brexit. Um, I don't know how much further down the line you can get before you want to have some clarity. And of course, if we have the transition period, then it's not possible to undertake trade deals during that period either, because you're still part, technically, of the the EU. So. This uncertainty is not good. I've heard from, for example, the Investment Association, which is the uh, umbrella organisation for financial, the financial sector. They've said, as long ago as a year ago, they were losing jobs already. It wasn't so much that jobs have been lost that are here, but jobs that would have come here and they've been established elsewhere in France and Germany in particular. So, yeah, we need to have uh, some clarity on trade. And the idea that's further down the line isn't really good enough. I want to move on from that to a couple of other questions on different themes. Um, the Scottish National Investment Bank has come up in conversation with quite a, a, a great deal of the people who have been in front of us during this uh, inquiry. Um, and I'd like to ask how the Scottish National Investment Bank will be used to promote inclusive growth, for example, uh, and tackle regional disparities, encourage more female entrepreneurs and promote fair work, work practices. 
Well, it can do uh, it, all of these things. It's it's going to be, uh, if you like, mission-centred, so that Scottish ministers will be establishing missions for the bank. Uh, Mariana Matsukuto, um, who's an advisor both uh, to the First Minister on the Council of Economic Advisers and a very prominent advisor to the UK government as well, has been very uh, strong on this point. In fact, I, I think you would say that in terms of the proposals come forward from Benny Higgins on the National Investment Bank, she's been the architect of that side of things. So it is, of course, possible and desirable for for the National Investment Bank to achieve uh, other goals than just uh, straightforward economic growth, whether that's greater opportunities for uh, women, uh, women's enterprises uh, or for fair work. Um, crucially, I think the biggest impact from the um, investment bank will be its ability to both um, shape and maximise markets in Scotland. So it can take a look right across a supply chain and, and decide to invest in different parts of the supply chain. And there is no reason why um, it can't take decisions which, of course, and there are reasons why it should take decisions which are going to maximise inclusive growth, uh, fair work practices. And it can do that not least by uh, focusing on... Um, you know, higher paid sectors, uh, where the knowledge economy is very important as well. But these things will be developed in time as we go forward with the National Investment Bank. It might be Sam is the person that's been following us right the way through, maybe with a quick comment from him, Sam, if, if it can be now. Thank you. Um, so whilst it will be for the board and the management team of the bank to determine its investment strategy, it will be for ministers to set the strategic framework within which those investments will sit. We would expect ministers to engage widely on that strategic framework, so consulting with stakeholders from across the landscape, and importantly, be consistent with broader Scottish Government economic policy, so be that all the different elements of inclusive growth. There will also be an issue here in terms of the reporting framework for the board back into, the, into government, so thinking about the range of indicators which determine whether the bank has been successful or otherwise. I don't think that will just be about financial return, but will include broader social and economic criteria as well. So there will be plenty of opportunities to lock those kind of criteria into the performance of the bank. Uh, thank you. Um, we mentioned earlier on about the medium-sized businesses. We've got a lot of SMEs and, 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 and the big gap in between. That's something that comes up time and time again. Um, it's also a barrier to access to business support as well. The, you, you get access to a lot of support when you're, you're starting out. You get access to a lot of support if you've got a certain amount of turnover and there's a, a gap in the middle. Um, so you, do you see um, the Scottish National Inv Investment Bank plugging that access to finance gap that's potentially, particularly since the financial crash and the, the banking crisis, means that uh, those businesses are not getting um, financial support or access to lending from those high street banks that the Scottish National Inv uh, Investment Bank could be uh, plug that gap that exists at the moment. Certainly, and I think it can take quite a big role in relation to that, not just in terms of big um, uh, projects which might be about developing the infrastructure to service a market. I think it can take decisions, and we're looking at, uh, as you'll know from the implementation plan, different schemes that we currently run being developed underneath the bank and being part of what the bank's offer is in terms of uh, the first port of call for finance. There is some controversy, or at least uh, different views, on uh, the availability of finance. The banks will say that um, there's not the appetite um, for amongst businesses for for uh, the finance that they are willing to make available, partly because of a, a kind of inhibition since the financial crash. But we talk to businesses and they say that the right finance at the right price uh, and the right scale is still something they find it hard to achieve. So yes, the bank could help uh, achieve that. And uh, we will also look to rationalise the offer that we make in terms of finance. Less involved in business supports, but certainly in access to finance, that will be a fundamental part of the bank. Okay. Um, I want to move on to the barriers that we've um, heard about to women in, in the economy in particular, whether that be in work, with regard to pay with the gender pay gap, or setting up in business. And it's been highlighted as, a, 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 I guess, a, a big, mis uh, big mis economic opportunity for Scotland. And we've heard, for example, that Scottish enterprise don't adopt a different strategy when dealing with women-led businesses, despite the evidence showing that um, if you have a different approach to working with female entrepreneurs, that you can actually, uh, um, I suppose, unlock their, their potential. What more do you think that could be done with the enterprise agencies to tackle the barriers that there are to unleashing the potential? Of, of women-led business? I think the, 
I mean, there's been a number of things said, so unconscious bias is mentioned as well about the way that um, uh, people can approach the issue of uh, women's enterprise. I've done some work uh, myself in relation to Women's Enterprise Scotland and what they've done, um, uh, not least in terms of the military, so uh, often wives, but otherwise spouses of serving military personnel, and they've taken a very different approach to some of the enterprise companies or enterprise organisations which try to help um, the general population. So I think the most important thing to do would be to listen to that. So if Women's Enterprise Scotland, and led by somebody who's very experienced in this area, um, can point to the ways in which the offer and the dialogue that's held uh, with women should be changed in order to better encourage that take-up, uh, then we should do that. So I think it is a question first of all of these organisations saying to us, this is the way in which we think you could change and have an impact. Your starting point to say that to the extent, I think the First Minister said this a number of times, if we have the same number of women establishing businesses as we do have men, the change to the GDP of Scotland would be absolutely phenomenal. So it's an untapped resource. And in addition to the things that we're already doing, if there's more that we can do in terms of how we go about it, I'm certainly very receptive to hearing that. And Yes, Please. and just... just out of Given that we've just talked about the enterprise agencies and how they could do things different around the things that you just mentioned, taking the advice of, of agencies like Women's Enterprise Scotland, would you see that advice be something that the Scottish National Investment Bank would take with regard for the same thing, but access to finance rather than support? Uh, yes, and again, as Sam mentioned previously, it will be for ministers to set the framework and also um, establish the missions for that. And of course, that's a perfectly legitimate mission to have to increase the take up of uh, women in terms of uh, business and setting up their own enterprises. So yes, it can have that role. It's also worth saying it's not just um, uh, Scottish Government uh, Business Gateway as an important role to play here as well at local authority level. Thank you. Thanks. For Very quick. Yeah. There was good evidence from Professor Sarah Carter, actually, at our Inclusive Growth Conference, that women enterprises are as successful as male-led enterprises, but they just start, they're undercapitalised at the start. So when you when you adjust for that, they're, they're, they are as successful. And there may be something about patient capital that's required in a different format. Thank you very much. Uh, right, now move on to Jimmy Harker johnson Thank you very much. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and, and to the other panellists. Um, just before I ask the question I was, uh, I'm kind of going to move on to, which is about regional um, kind of variations, uh, we talked a little bit, uh, you talked a little bit earlier about some of the successful policies or the policies that you felt had impact. Um, you know, given that some of the purpose targets haven't been met and, and may not be met, do you have an opinion on some of the policies that you've brought through or some of the initiatives that you or previous uh, economy secretaries or the government have brought through that perhaps haven't worked that you might have done differently over the last 10, 11 years? Um, no, I'm not going to criticise my predecessors in any way. I think there's been a great deal so of good work done. You might have improved on, perhaps. Well, I, I think the one thing I would say is, when establishing these targets, um, I think it's important to establish targets over which you have the control to achieve or not achieve. And I think, as I've mentioned before, and has, has been conceded by Greg Clark, there are two governments at work in the Scottish economy. So if you set yourself a target... Um, which you alone cannot be responsible for achieving, then I think that's a difficulty. Um, so I think uh, we should be very careful to make sure that when we establish targets that we do so knowing the different organisations that will sometimes include local government, sometimes the UK government um, in relation to that. But no, I can't uh, think of um, particular initiatives which I would um, say were, were wrong. The suggestion there was you may not have set a target on economic growth. Sorry? The suggestion there is that you may not have targeted... I think it's perfectly legitimate for governments to set targets for economic growth. In fact, it's desirable to do so. I just think a greater appreciation of the factors which will have to contribute towards that and the extent to which the government can be responsible for achieving it is, is important as well. OK. Um, you, you talked to earlier, also about the, um, the UK economy and how you felt, uh, obviously, it was very much focused on um, the south-east of England. Obviously, I'm Highland Science MSP, and there, there are some, perhaps, in my region that may think the central belt of Scotland um, gets a lot of focus as well. But I was just going to ask, um, you know, regional development is very important. Can you tell me a little bit about, certainly for the next few years, how you think uh, Scottish government's economic policy is going to benefit the regions? 
Uh, well, I think perhaps the most obvious example would be, and it's a compliment to the Highlands, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise in particular, is the establishment of the South of Scotland Agency. And that recognises what's been felt to be for a long time um, a very particular focus on the South of Scotland. Uh, and even within the South of Scotland, the borders is not the same as Dumfries and Galloway. Um, so I think that focus and also the uh, inclusion within the remit of that new body to have the ability to be involved in social and community initiatives as well, because you will know very well that in the Highlands, the success of High has been about establishing um, the capacity, not just the, the businesses and the jobs, but the capacity for people to start up businesses. And sometimes that's meant they've been involved in the cultural and social space as well. So that is uh, extremely important to it. Incidentally, uh, there's a perception that Scottish enterprise can't do that, but they can, they're perfectly able to do that as well. So I think that that is uh, one factor. I think beyond that, in terms of uh, regional um, development, we have tried to be very um, focused in terms of the infrastructure works that we've carried out over the last 10 years to make sure it's not just the central belt of Scotland that um, uh, benefits from that. So the borders rail, um, you know, biggest new a piece of railway infrastructure, a new rail line for over 100 years in the UK was specifically down to the borders. The two biggest roads projects that we have are the A9 and the A96 duelling projects, each potentially around £3 billion, uh, which dwarf even the Queen's Ferry Crossing, which was less than half of one of those projects. Um, so I think, uh, and also in terms of some of the rail improvements to the Highlands and across between Aberdeen and Inverness as well, are very important. Beyond that, I would say that uh, the biggest issue in relation to this area will be the Shared Prosperity Fund. What's going to replace uh, the funds which have been so crucial in the Highlands um, and other parts of the country, south of Scotland and Fries and Galloway, in terms of supporting um, businesses, skills development that have come from the EU? And if you don't know even 10 months out uh, what that's going to be, that, that's, that's already starting to cause confusion and uncertainty. So getting to the bottom of that and I hope to work with Greg Clark to achieve that will be very important for regional development in Scotland as well. Thanks very much. Um, looking at that, I mean, you mentioned obviously uh, the important thing about small businesses. I was noting the FSB um, highlighted, I think, it's 79 uh, out, of, um, out of every thousand in, in Orkney of higher percentages than other parts of Scotland. Th these small businesses, particularly if they're in the tourism sector, but, but wider than that, can be, are very much affected by, affected by the infrastructure around them, whether that's broadband or transport. Um, how can the government, uh, I suppose, ensure kind of going forward that projects like uh, has been discussed, RET, uh, to the Northern Isles, can be delivered more quickly. I appreciate um, the Cabinet Secretary is not like to make an announcement today on it, but you know we, we in the Northern Isles have been waiting a considerable amount of time for RET to be introduced. A broadband infrastructure is still very, uh, very sporadic um, in reliability. How can we ensure that projects like that uh, or schemes like that can be introduced uh, more quickly? Uh, well, I think in relation to RET, um, of course, the implementation of RET, if you did it the same way as we had done for the Western Isles, would be counterproductive for Shetland. It might be beneficial to Orkney, but would be uh, much less so to Shetland. So there is some sensitivity as to how that's done. And despite the fact, as you say, it's not been introduced as yet, there have been other measures taken, not least in this year's budget, to improve the situation and affordability of fares in the Northern Isles. Uh, it's really a question, I think, for, for Hamza Youssef. But in terms of broad Broadband, which is really a question for Fergus Ewing, I think it's a very important point that you make because you know that if in rural areas you don't have the um, connectivity in terms of transport links and the ability to have a digital uh, or virtual link, uh, whether it's in terms of your employment, your education or your health, is absolutely crucial. So what we are trying to do is, through the R100 programme, make sure that every single business, every single um, individual in Scotland is connected to superfast broadband by 2021. That goes, and it's the 30 bits uh, per second, which is three times the level of the speed that the UK government wants to achieve uh, in England and Wales. So I think that that's happening. We're, we're very high up in terms of the 90s now, but that's got to be rolled out. And Fergus Ewing's been very keen to try and say, let's do rural first. It needs it most. Let's not always focus on the, the, the urban area. So I think that that is happening, but... Um, and happy to come back to you in writing on, on the situation with RET, uh, as Hamza Youssef would, would be able to tell me. That'd be healthy. One very last question, uh, quick last question. Um, uh, a number of organisations have, uh, have talked about the, the, the skills gap um, kind of going forward. W which areas are you particularly focused on? Which, um, I suppose, representative bodies or sectors have, have uh, expressed concern that, um, you know, the skills needs of the future aren't 
being met and may not be met going forward? Yeah, I suppose it's important to distinguish between a skills gap and a labour gap. So there are labour shortages um, and demands in certain areas and areas which you'll be very um, familiar with and concerned about. So uh, hospitality in terms of uh, agriculture as well. But we are having uh, the skills gaps in terms of digital um, skills. Uh, there are skills gaps in terms of... Um, a, Generally, in some of the biblical trades, we've got skills gaps there as well. So we are trying to address that through the apprenticeship thing. And if, if I could get uh, Hugh McAloon, convener, to say a couple of words, this is his area of expertise here as well. Um, um, looking into where skills gaps might emerge, um, I think it's quite important that we've got a dynamic approach because the labour market's changing a lot. And increasingly, we're starting to look towards the existing workforce. Most of our interventions at the moment are focused on young people, which is the right thing to continue to focus on, and it certainly has been with high unemployment. But quite a lot of work going on between ourselves, SDS and Scottish Funding Council, around aligning skills planning. So with the resource we have, um, deployed through two agencies, through very different approaches, if you look at institutional funding through colleges and universities compared to work-based learning through the apprenticeship programme. They are very different forms of training, but it's still absolutely critical that we don't duplicate in some areas and we don't underserve other areas. And as the economy moves towards different sectors and demand moves as best we can, I think it's important to keep um, that alignment um, as close to, as possible to um, what employers and what um, industry is needing. So you're not in a situation where young people coming into the labour market or those seeking to transition are going on courses that don't actually lead to um, where the demand in the labour market is and you don't have skill shortages coming through. Um, that's a, a tough job. I think it's a job that you know is a bit of a holy grail in this area, but you know actually having the two agencies taking things forward together um, and thinking about all the labour market information that's at their disposal for the, the horizon that's sensible um, and then planning that together and executing that together and reviewing it together um, is really important. I think looking much further forward, I think lots of people can speculate about the sort of labour market we'll have in 10, 15 years' time. I think there's a lot of things could happen in that time. I think if we look back 10 years, None of us were sitting with smartphones in their pockets, and now that's an intrinsic part of how some people do their jobs. Um, so things like that are maybe harder to predict. I think you can, though, look at certain things. So a high proportion of the workforce for 20 years from now is already in the workforce. Um, so you know, people in their 30s and 40s are already in the labour market. And I guess the, the thing for them is, if there are going to be changes, it's that support for people to transition. Um, the Cabinet Secretary's already spoken about um, just transition around um, low carbon, but that sort of thing. So contrary of the time. Sure. Um, could, would you therefore suggest that going forward, a larger percentage perhaps of, of, that, of, of the budget for that would, uh, for, for training, for, for the education side, would be focused on post 24s transitioning people reskilling moving in between different sectors i think it's about ensuring that our um, our support and our funding is focused where it's most needed so if that is a change um around about you know more of a focus on the existing workforce if that's where the demand is then i think that's where we've got to consider our investment um, but we can i don't think ever get complacent. We've had a, a real drop in youth unemployment, and I've been around that the whole time from when it was 23% down to 10% today. Um, you can't be complacent about that because every year there's about another 50,000 kids coming in, either from school, college or university. So it's getting that balance right, which is challenging, but I think if you look at labour market challenges that we face. One, one of the big ones is how we support an existing workforce um, to maintain um, its levels of income and enhance its productivity across a very dynamic looking future labour market. OK, thank you. Dean Lockhart, did you have a very quick supplementary? Actually to one of Gordon McDonald's questions, so I can come in later. OK, yes. that's fine. Thank I'll you. hand over to Gordon McDonald now.
bloody knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> just, just on that point of um, reskilling the workforce, um, Cabinet Secretary said earlier on that uh, unemployment records are at near record low, uh, unemployment levels, sorry, are near record lows. Um, but what about the position of um, disabled workers where it's a situation where their employment levels tend to be around 43%? What is happening in relation to supporting them and tackling inequality in general terms? It's a very good point, and of course the Parliament's debating that this afternoon, um, and I think it's one area we've not done um, uh, as much as we, we should have done uh, in relation to addressing that, and it's, we've got a very ambitious target to half um, that figure. Uh, and I think we're helped to some extent by the change in procurement rules for supported businesses now, which can be of a broader definition under European regulations. That should help us to do that. But uh, this has been taken forward both by uh, Jean Freeman and uh, Jamie Hepburn in my portfolio. I think there's a, a great deal more we have to do. We have to try and concentrate on what people's abilities are rather than what their disabilities are so that we have a clear idea of what work they are able to undertake and to make sure that the workplaces that they have to work in are as receptive as possible to them. But I think you're right. And I think this week we've seen a, a move by the UK government to reduce, I think it's called the Protected Places uh, Scheme, which could put potentially another 660 people with disabilities on uh, out of work. And I think that, that would be counterproductive. So I think there's representations going on with the UK government to try and avoid that. Nobody's done as well as they could have done. We have made major strides, but still a lot of work to do in terms of uh, the gender issues in the workplace, similarly with black and uh, minority ethnic groups. But in terms of people with disabilities, we've got a lot more to do. Okay, thanks very much. Um, moving on to my questions um, about the agency support that's out there for SMEs, etc. Um, the Scottish Government has identified six growth sectors ranging from food and drink to life sciences. Can you say what the impact has been of having that focus on Scotland's economic performance? I think it is important. If you take one example, the food and drink sector, a real focus uh, on that, and you've seen exponential growth in food and drink over the last uh, 10 years. I mentioned just um, last night's opening of the new distillery in um, Murray, but there are new distilleries proposed, uh, new distilleries cropping up all over the place, but there's ones proposed in both Barora and Argyll and Butte by Diageo. Um, so... <clears throat> That focus on the food and drink sector has been really important. I think we want to see uh, a sharpening of the focus in terms of what geographies we're going after as well, allied to the sectors that we have, uh, and also the focus that we have in terms of uh, manufacturing. So the establishment of the National Manufacturing Institute um, is really important for giving us a focus on an area of the economy which whether in Scotland or the UK or other countries, we have seen uh, neglect of manufacturing such that we uh, expect that we will get, uh, we will use things which are produced elsewhere by and large. And I don't think we should accept that. And the First Minister said that in the programme for government as well. So uh, I think this focus on those sectors can, as demonstrated by the food and drink sector, as demonstrated, demonstrated also in terms of some of the fintech developments in the financial sector, can have a very beneficial impact. And the most obvious uh, measure of that would be in terms of the growth in food and drink. And can you say, I mean, you've, you've touched upon um, other areas slightly outside the, the growth areas, but what support is available to those SMEs whose businesses are out with those growth areas? Well, I think this is a, is, is a good question, and we are seeing uh, a changing landscape, both, first of all, through the Enterprise and Skills uh, Review, uh, in terms of the changes to Scottish Enterprise, so with the establishment of the South of Scotland Agency, and also, I think, some really encouraging developments, such as the Ayrshire with the Economic Partnership, so the three councils have come together to look afresh at how they can provide business support in their area. So I think... Um, if there is support that's not there, one of the criticisms I see in previous evidence to the committee is that um, becoming an account-managed company with Scottish Enterprise is too difficult or too exclusive. Uh, we don't want to see that happen. We want to see um, businesses getting the support they deserve. A lot of businesses just ask you to get out of the way so they can get on and do what they want to do, and that's fine. But for those that do need support, we want to make it as wide as possible. Um, this is more... Uh, Mary's area, but we, just to reassure the committee, are looking at the evidence that you've taken and seeing if there are points of action for us in relation to this um, business support. We've talked this morning a bit about 
innovation and the funding that's in place, etc. And we've got these innovation centres as well. And Scotland continues to come up with the innovations and inventions from, uh, you know, big data, fintech, life sciences. Um, but again, out with those known growth areas, what support is in place for university spin-offs or for new uh, innovative businesses that aren't within those growth sectors? Uh, well, I think there is support. One of the criticisms that the universities have had is that they've been very good at uh, developing um, uh, spin-outs, but not scale-ups. And also the fact that they sometimes find it hard to let go, say, if, for example, of an equity share when the private sector could take things on to a, a further level. So that discussion is now, because the Scottish Funding Council is uh, a partner in the Enterprise Board and represented on the Strategic Board of the en Following Enterprise and Skills Review, that discussion is much better now, I think. You can see early signs of that. Nora Senior may have told you that when she appeared before the committee. So the SFC sitting next to Scottish Enterprise, next to Highlands and Islands Development uh, and so on, they can have these discussions. And I think there is now a much greater uh, appreciation in the university sector I mean, if you think of Harriet Watts, Edinburgh, Edinburgh is just a hugely powerful economic engine itself, Edinburgh University, in terms of what they do. Um, and even in my own area, Stirling University, it's had the innovation park for a long time now. I think there is a, a greater appreciation of trying to maximise the economic impact of these areas. But if there, again, if there are any gaps where people feel because they're not in a sector that's been highlighted, that shouldn't be there. There should be support for all businesses. Then they'll be keen to hear about those and see how we can address them. Is there a role for the Scottish National Investment Bank in supporting these innovative businesses? Yeah, I'm conscious that the list of demands on a body which is not even yet established uh, grows day by day. Um, but yes, of course, um, if especially in relation to that scale-up um, uh, idea that you're talking about, that um, companies, and it was mentioned earlier on in this discussion, companies which have done well, perhaps have innovated, we don't want to see that just fly off elsewhere. We want to see it scaled up here and the jobs and the benefit that come with it take place here. So, of course, uh, I mentioned that the National Investment Bank should be involved in shaping markets. Well, if that means expanding the Indigenous Scottish presence in markets, then that's got to be a good thing. OK, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Gordon. Dean Lockhart, I promised you a supplementary. Yeah, no, thanks very much. It was actually on, on the Scottish National Investment Bank and given it um, long term the uh, plan for the bank to inject long-term capital into the economy. Recommendations um, 6 and 13 of the implementation plan talk about uh, a 10, 15-year horizon by which the, the bank will, will be judged. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm that the bank will continue to use sterling as its currency for that uh, period of 10 to 15 years? I think that would make me the person that's got uh, the job of trying to establish certainty going forward to a 15-year period when nobody else can do that. Who knows what changes are going to happen over the course of that time? That's the currency they're going to work in, I'm sure, when they're started. Um, but beyond that, who can say what currency changes are going to make? I certainly can't. I'm not a currency expert. Uh, well, despite the fact we only had six uh, committee members uh, here today, we seem to have filled up our time quite well, and that's partly because uh, I think we've had good questions and answers. So thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and to your team. Did you have any final comment you wanted to make before we finish? No, and just to say that the points are made, Convener, in relation to the evidence that the committee has taken, we are, well, obviously we'll wait and see what recommendations the committee want to make, but we are looking at that just now, and there may be changes that we'll make in the meantime as well. But thank you for the committee's work. That's great. Well, thank you for all your time, and I suspend this meeting just for a minute to allow the um, witnesses to leave. Okay, the item three is the Bankruptcy Fees Scotland Regulations 2018. And uh, our item here is to consider it a uh, Regulation 2018 SSI 2018-127. The committee will recall we wrote to the Minister outlining our concerns over the 2017 regulations 
and that instrument was subsequently withdrawn. Our general concerns at that time were the lack of transparent, consistent and understandable processes for setting fees, clarity over the extent of cost recovery and the impact of fee increases on stakeholders. We have now received views on this iteration of the regulations from ICAS, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, Alan McIntosh and Money Advice Scotland. And it may be worth noting that the current regulations will not take forward a number of the fee increases which had been proposed in the 2017 regulations. The bankruptcy fees charged to debtors will not change and there will be an increase in the fee charged to a creditor to apply for a debtor's bankruptcy. In brief, the accountant in bankruptcy has gone some way to addressing the committee's concerns about the 2017 regulations. So at this stage, does any member have any substantive issues they wish to raise eh, by way of comment eh, about these regulations before we move on to making a de decision about them? I'm well, not hearing any uh, comments from members present. So are we content that the instrument comes into force? Yes? Yes, members are agreed. Uh, as we agreed at our previous meeting, we will also draft a response to the minister and we'll consider that uh, in private. So I now suspend this meeting and we will move into private session. Thank you very much.